Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, I would like to welcome you in this new meeting, the Options Society of Nephrology and Transplantation, CME meetings uh, that are held in uh, usual date of Wednesday, usual time, 9 p.m. Today, we are all proud to have our moderator, Professor Rashab Barsoom. And to introduce Professor Rashab Barsoom, his name is more than enough. Professor Rashab Barsoom is the father of nephrology in Egypt, Africa, and in Arab world. He was one of the major founders of the, our society, Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation, and of Arab Society of Nephrology and African Society of Nephrology. Professor Rashad is the past general secretary of ISN, uh, and he is known for his activities in the uh, all over the world in, in this society. Moreover, he is in the topology and he was the leader of this section. For all of these activities, Professor Rashad won the Nile Prize, which is the major prize in Egypt a few years ago, and now is considered and one of the ma major professors in Egypt, Arab world, Africa, and all over the world. He is the professor and teacher of many and many generations, which was myself, I am proud to be a little one of them. Uh, we are a happy and very lucky to have Professor Rashad today, who insisted to be with us uh, this night and tolerated us our uh, delay of this meeting for one week. And for this, we are all happy to have Professor Rashad today. And to excuse me all to leave the floor to Professor Rashad to introduce our speaker today, Professor Mohsen Kosi. Please, Professor Rashad. Thank you very much, Yasser, for this very nice introduction. But I want to correct um, an information that you provided. I am not really the father of nephrology. In Egypt, the father of nephrology in Egypt is late Professor Abdelmana Hasaballah, who is the father of our president today. Uh, so I have to give tribute to this great man who taught me a lot uh, and uh, prepared the whole uh, scenario for me. So when I became old, uh, some people called me father. If you like to call me father of nephrology, then you have to call Hasaballah, the grandfather of uh, nephrology in this uh, country. Uh, I am really pleased and honored to present Mohsen Ousi because it's not a casual relation uh, that binds me with Mohsen Ousi. Uh, I don't remember, was it 25 or 30 years ago, Mohsen, uh, when uh, you were uh, defending your thesis for the doctorate degree in Asyut University. Our colleagues in Asyut uh, called me and told me, we want you to discuss uh, this uh, thesis because we do have a brilliant demonstrator here. And he, his challenge was that you discuss this thesis. So I got excited about this uh, uh, man who wants to be challenged for, for defending his thesis. And I traveled to Asyut, went to the major theater where he was supposed to present. And I was amazed. I was stunned to see someone of his caliber. Uh, he was so self-confident, so knowledgeable. There was, uh, mo it, it was mostly cytokines and, uh, and molecular biology. And he insisted because people didn't know what is meant, for instance, by TNF alpha. So whenever he presented a name of the cytokines, he had to say it in full, tumor necrosis factor alpha, uh, uh, and so on. And he presented amazingly well. Uh, and I kept him in, his, in, in my mind and saw him progressing from Asyut to uh, Sheffield, UK. And uh, I used to go to Sheffield every winter to uh, uh, give a few lectures uh, in a different way than I has, uh, used to run in Sheffield. And I used to meet uh, Mohsen in the, uh, in the later years of my contribution there. And uh, I heard every good thing about him from Nahas, from his colleagues, from everyone, and uh, attended some of the meetings where he uh, spoke or uh, presented cases and so on. 
And I, I felt so proud to see that young man from Asyut University who challenged me to, uh, to discuss his thesis to become a world-class uh, nephrologist and academician. Uh, and the time, the time has run so fast that I'm now presenting him as the experts from the UK coming to, to talk to us. What else can you, can please you, uh, other than watching someone growing and blossoming and becoming Mohsen Rousi? He has major contributions in nephrology, clinical nephrology and academic nephrology. Uh, and today he is going to talk to us about uh, something very itchy in, in nephrology and the rest of science about evidence-based uh, medicine in, in at large. I'm sure he is going to give us uh, the pros and maybe, maybe he's going to talk about some of the cons uh, of uh, taking evidence-based nephrology and evidence-based science as the rule. If he's not going to say so, I'll ask him to say so <laughs> and tell us, is it the end of the progress in uh, science to depend on evidence base or does it have some negative sides? Thank you very much for coming, Mohsen. And I now leave the floor again to you. I pass it to you to uh, teach us about this important topic. Thank you, Mohsen. Thank you so much. I'm not sure how I can just, I mean, face these words, to be honest. The only word that I can say that Professor Yasser, I'm very grateful for this opportunity that I have this chance tonight, to be honest. I am very, very grateful. Um, uh, Professor Ashad, I just, I mean, uh, take this word from Professor Yasser. Your name is enough. I don't think that I need to say anything else. Um, uh, the only thing that I might just remind you and remind all of us that Professor Faisal Shaheen was my supervisor for this thesis. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, he is now here. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think that I mean, I, I'm, I'm very, very glad, to be honest, uh, tonight, to have the expertise, as we have used to have from yourself. Uh, it is a great opportunity to learn from yourself, and obviously from the other colleagues about this itchy and the tough topic. And I'm sure that you will make it more easy, not me, myself, it is yourself, you will make it more easy and digestible by all of us. Thank, Thank you, you so very, very much for yourself. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Riazer, for this opportunity again. Uh, let me start Welcome probably Professor with this. Uh, Welcome, Professor. Uh, let me start with this, probably the, uh, uh, can I share the screen? Yeah. You can stop me at any time while I'm talking if there is anything is unclear. I will start by the history. In 1981, we faced with a very important question about the benefit uh, of the beta blocker on those patients who has experienced uh, myocardial infarction. And I have got two reviews in 1981 by two eminent cardiologists in two very high rank journals, the BMJ and the European Heart Journal with very different opinions. Someone is pro and the other one is anti the beta blockers. As we can see, Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Hampton, both of them, they have bought a review and both of them, they have bought their own support, uh, but they are opposing to each other. So it is very confusing and challenging how we can get the answer to this question, how we can get the answer very objectively, rather than we have got the bias of the authors. And Professor Yasser asked me in particular to focus on the meta-analysis and the systematic review in particular, probably because they stay, I mean, sit on the top of the hierarchy of the evidence-based medicine. And we will see now here, as we can see, in the bottom of this pyramid, we can see the expert opinion, Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Hampton. And in the top, we will see the systematic reviews and the meta-analysis. And on top of the meta-analysis, we'll see the guidelines. So there is no guidelines 
a tool to come up without meta-analysis. And obviously there is no meta-analysis without systematic review. And as you can see from the screen, the smaller the risk of the bias, the higher the quality of the evidence that we have got. So you can see the risk of bias is high with the expert opinion, where the experts put their um, opinion just to select the articles that they feel suitable for their opinion, and they reject what they feel is against their opinion. That's why they came up with what we call it now, the systematic review and the importance of the systematic review and the meta-analysis for the evidence-based medicine. What is the difference? We can see, I mean, in the literature, many things about systematic review, narrative review. Clearly the systematic review, it is a very objective method to get the evidence base. Dislike the narrative review. In the systematic review, the data themselves control the outcome, not the authors. It is the quality of the studies included in the review will be controlling the outcome of the opinion at the end. And it is replicable. So if someone else comes and wanted to do the same thing, he will come, come up with the same opinion and he will not differ with the differing opinion between Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Hampton. The narrative review where the, I mean, any one of us just to select an, a, a topic and he will just select whatever the, I mean, the type of the uh, articles that he would like to choose to defend his opinion and he will put the review in the uh, publication. Systematic review has got a very, from the name, it has got a very systematic way of getting out of the evidence at the end. What is the difference between the systematic review and the meta-analysis? Clearly the systematic review, it is a qualitative description of the pooled literature of a certain topic. In the meta-analysis, it is the quantitative method. You do, you do some statistical analysis to come up with a conclusion from the pooled data of that uh, question. If there are, I mean, uh, do we have any other advantages for the, I mean, systematic review and the meta-analysis? Yes. It first of all will show the consistency of the intervention effect in the different population because you, you repeat the studies in many occasions and you will find the same conclusion, probably. Sometimes in rare diseases, you do have difficulty recruiting patients and participants in the trials. And what you end up with you end up with a non-powered, uh, small-sized sample studies, and might be you will come up with non-significant results. Having multiple studies pulled together, this will increase the power occasionally if it is applied appropriately by the meta-analysis statistical methods, and you can just come up with a statistically significant result which will benefit, obviously, the clinical applicability. The systematic review and the meta-analysis will bring up all available evidence for this particular clinical question. And uh, it can sometimes, do, I mean, generate hypothesis. Say, for example, we have got a meta-regression. You do the meta-analysis and you do regression for the included studies. And you find that the intervention that you have chosen work better or work differently in a subgroup of population from the study. Say, for example, it works better in the elderly, in the proteinuric diabetics or non-proteinuric diabetics. Then this creates some sort of question. Shall we do a powered study and large randomized control trial to tackle this question and see whether this intervention will work better in terms of dealing with the proteinuric or non-proteinuric or whatever come up from the uh, meta regression or so the subgroup analysis. Do we do the systematic review and the meta analysis just only for the guidelines or the evidence base? To be honest, no. Usually, I mean, if you would like to say, for example, to apply for a grant, you do a systematic review. So the, I mean, funding authorities will look into the unmet needs from your systematic review to say that, okay, this application worth trying this clinical question. 
because there is no available evidence enough and we need to answer this question. Sometimes when you do a thesis or PhD, you do a systematic review. Uh, sometimes the health care authorities, when they approve or authorize a drug, they would like to have the available evidence for the pros and the cons, the uh, efficacy and the safety of this drug and the systematic review and the meta-analysis might answer this question. This is the historical background of the systematic review and the meta-analysis. And the milestones we can see that started by 1988, but in 1993, we have got the Cochrane uh, Library and Collaboration. Unfortunately, the one who suggested this approach, he died before he can see this project, uh, Professor Cochrane. And then uh, there is a group in 1999 established the way of the quality of reporting of the uh, meta-analysis. So the quality of reporting of the uh, meta-analysis called the quorum, which stands for what I'm said, the quality of reporting. And then what we call it is the Prisma statement. And we have got the latest Prisma statement in 2020. Prisma, which is the preferred uh, reporting idea for the systematic review and the meta-analysis. Uh, what is this preferred reporting? The thing is, when you do a systematic review, you have got the steps should be followed and it should be mentioned clearly in the publication. So we can appraise the systematic review through this way. And you need to write down the flow chart of the Prisma. What is this? I mean, we need to have a very quick uh, knowledge about what we can do, how we can do the systematic review. You start with the uh, very simple, very clear research question. Um, you would like to know the evidence base and usually the format of this question called PICO. The PICO P stands for the participants, I stands for the intervention, C stands for the comparator, whether there is a placebo or other intervention, and the O is the outcome. So this is the simple research question. And after establishing this question, you will start for uh, doing the methodology, the methodology of the systematic review. You will have usually two or three uh, reviewers or researchers work on this area by uh, retrieving the uh, citation from published and unpublished literature. Obviously, the published is very easy to do. We have got a lot of search engines to get this uh, citation, but the problem is the gray literature or the unpublished ones because we have got now plenty of the randomized controlled trials, which doesn't, uh, which do not go to the way of application. Say, for example, because of a conflict of interest or negative results, and the drug company do, does not want to show these results. And we need to say that this study was not published. And this is just to reduce or minimize the risk of bias, that there were some sort of negative results have not been published because of this reason. And that's why. And nowadays, to do a randomized control trial, you need to register this randomized control trial in the clinical trials registry for this particular reason. So you know that you know the steps of the trial up to the end, whether it is published or not published, the results. Once you have got the, uh, the uh, clinical question, you have got the reviewers, uh, and you have got the citations. Uh, you will start to be uh, after just getting the exclusion and the inclusion criteria, and you need to write all this methodology in the uh, when you publish the systematic review. So anyone comes after you would be re re I mean uh, replicate what you you have done, and you will come up with the same results. There will be no difference whatsoever because the I mean the ways that he did it is exactly the same what you did, and you, at, at each step you will just write down the number of citations you have got and why you have excluded them. If you have got a dispute between yourself and the other researchers, you have got adjudicator or another senior researcher who can, uh, I mean, uh, solve or sort out this dispute. And usually you need to publish the, uh, I mean, the agreement percentage, what we call it CAPA statistics, uh, because Depending on this agreement or disagreement, there will be the, the, uh, the quality of the systematic review. 
whether the, I mean, say for example, the usually the, I mean, the percentage varies between zero and 100%. And if it is 100%, there is, a, I mean, clearly clear agreement. If it is, say for example, uh, sorry, 50% clear disagreement, 100% clear disagreement, or there will be no agreement at all. After, I mean, having the exclusion and inclusion criteria, and you put this flow chart at each step, you will end up with the number, eligible number of studies, which you are going to include in the systematic review. And you will do the descriptive uh, or qualitative analysis of the published studies for this clinical question. And this is one of the, I mean, studies has been published about the effect of ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers in normal tensive patients with diabetic kidney disease. And as you can see with the flow chart, and they have clearly put how much, how many citations they have got at the initial, uh, uh, initial uh, search and ended up with around only 13 studies. And they have put the reason at each step when they have excluded these studies. And obviously should be full agreement between two, the two researchers who have been doing this uh, search. So if there is any difference between the systematic review and the meta-analysis, yes, as we said, the meta-analysis is a quantitative, the systematic review is qualitative. In the systematic review, you can use the randomized controlled trial and observational studies. In the meta-analysis, because it is a robust uh, quality of evidence and you are doing statistics for the pooled data, you can't do the observational studies in the systematic review. Uh, rarely to use the, them because it will be very heterogeneous. And if the studies that you are using in the pooled analysis for the meta-analysis were very heterogeneous, you can't do the uh, appropriate systematic, uh, sorry, meta-analysis. Uh, obviously, you have got to appraise the systematic review methods themselves, as I've mentioned, and you have also to raise the studies included in the systematic review, because the systematic review is as good as the studies upon which they are based. If the studies that you have chosen, they are of poor quality, then the systematic review outcome and the meta-analysis based on them will be of poor quality. We have got plenty of, I mean, uh, assessment methods for the assessing the, uh, the uh, studies included in a systematic review, particularly the randomized control trial, the famous of them, the JADAD and the uh, modified JADAD and uh, the Cochrane one. And in any of them, you will just base your analysis or assessment on the risk of bias. If you are minimizing the risk of bias, which is a systematic error, then you will be toward the high quality studies. If the risk of bias is high, then you are toward the poor quality studies. So the methodology, we said that good systematic review, the results section is valid, primary studies chosen the high quality, inclusion and exclusion criteria for the systematic review. You just did a detailed search uh, engine, the midline personal contact and experts to include every single article about this topic and you end up with not missing any of them. And this is the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Usually you choose the participants, what sort of intervention you would like to use. If this is the RAS inhibition, or just say, for example, only the ACE inhibitor, not the angiotensin receptor blocker, the endpoints, whether you are looking for the, just say, for example, EGFR, proteinuria, survival, renal survival, whatever it would be, the, I mean, the studies were randomized or not randomized, and the reviewers are independent. And as we said, the human judgment uh, can cause random error, and this is acceptable, but if there is a systematic error, this equals bias. The qualities of studies, as we have said, the randomized control trial is the gold standard for the intervention and prospective court studies is the best, obviously, for diagnostic tests. If we are talking about diagnostic tests, the randomized control trial will not work, and you need to do a systematic review for a cohort studies. Uh, the non-randomized and observational studies overestimate the treatment effect uh, due to the lots of bias, and the study selection is based on more than one reviewer, 
uh, analyzing review. So this is, uh, usually in the systematic review or a good systematic review, as you put this, the PRISMA statement, uh, you put also a diagram for the assessment of your studies included in the systematic review. And this is looks like this. I will show it to you like this. And you put the different risks for each study is included. And in each study, you will put if it is a low risk, if say, for example, the selection uh, bias risk or the uh, allocation concealment or incomplete outcome data. If the risk is unknown or unclear, it is yellow or white. If it is a high risk, which is usually more than 50%, it will be in red. And obviously this will give an insight to the reader how is the quality of the studies included in the systematic review. If the systematic review didn't include the PRISMA flow chart, didn't include uh, the quality assessment of the studies, I will question the outcome of this systematic review. Uh, obviously, this ethics uh, point usually handled by the ethics committee, but you need to be aware about what are the components of the ethics that should be looked at when you are looking into a systematic review or meta-analysis. The most important one is the declaration of financial support. Might be the, I mean, the, uh, the author uh, has got, say, for example, some sort of shares in this company who is sponsoring the uh, intervention. So he should declare very clearly whether he has got any conflict of interest or not. Also, the power calculation should be very clear uh, the justification of the research question should be highlighted very clearly and whether it is appropriate to compare or not to compare for uh, a placebo or another intervention. As we all know, nowadays for diabetic population, say for example, when we tried to do the SGLT2 inhibitor guidelines for the UK, we said together we have been eight and we said that if the trial didn't have a baseline of RAS inhibition prior to include the the uh, SGLT2 inhibitor, this means that this trial will not be ethical because we know all of us that the RAS inhibition for the diabetic population is important. And that's why anyone who has got the diabetic nephropathy and any trial, usually you have got the RAS inhibition as a baseline or in the background, and then you put the new intervention. And then you just analyze the results which come up from this uh, meta-analysis or systematic review or from the study, whether these results are generalizable or not, whether they can benefit my patient in particular or not. And you can ask yourself a question. If the, my patient would be to participate in this trial, he would be eligible to take part in the trial or not. If he would be eligible to take part in the trial, then yes, it would benefit my page, uh, my uh, particular type of patients. Are they, the results cost effective or not? If this trial tool is available to use or it is not available to use, it is a very, I mean, uh, prestigious one, which we don't have any clear idea or we haven't got an access to a very expensive drug, say for example, like a, a Cluzimab. We don't have the access to this drug. So it doesn't work to look into the outcome of the results of this study. Does the outcome of the study matter in practice or not? It might not make any difference in the patient, say, for example, in a hard endpoint, not surrogate endpoint. And this is usually the example of how you report a summary of systematic review. At the end, you write down all these studies included, and you write down the authors of the main author of this study, the location, the type of intervention, the uh, outcome, and the primary outcome in particular, you might not need to mention the secondary outcomes, uh, what is the comparator and so forth. These are the three principles when you are publishing a systematic review. You would, the, the PRISMA statement, the uh, quality figure for the included studies and the quality, uh, the, uh, the, uh, quant sorry, the summary description for the included studies. The meta-analysis, it is the top of the systematic review. And before I can go to the meta-analysis, I ask myself this question. If, I mean, would be the included studies in the systematic review would be eligible to have or to get some statistical analysis from this pooled data? 
or in other words, would be these studies very heterogeneous in the participants, in the intervention, in the outcome, to the point that I can't make any statistical analysis from this systematic review or not. We have got, I mean, some sort of basic stats. I'm not going to do in, into depth of the technical issues, but we do the p-value or the chi-square for the different studies included in the systematic review. And if uh, they can just discriminate and between, uh, between the, I mean, the heterogene heterogeneous, I mean, uh, systematic review or non-heterogeneous systematic review. And this tool is very crude. Why that? Because the B-value doesn't weigh anything. It can say that it is significant or non-significant, but can't say, say, for example, how much is the weight of this study contributed to this review? If we have got a study with, uh, say, for example, 10,000 participants, and the result of this study came back to be significant, and we have got, uh, sorry, non-significant, and we have got another study with just only 30 participants, and it was very significant in terms of the B-value. So I don't have any difference in the weight of these two studies, but I know that this is was negative, uh, sorry, this is was non-significant, and the other one is significant. So they have just come up with the, what we call it, the I-square statistics. The I-square usually is written at the end of the uh, description of the meta-analysis results to say that whether there was any substantial level of heterogeneity or not. If it is more than 50%, the I square, then there will be a lot of heterogeneity and might be the outcome of this meta-analysis would be questionable. Uh, some statisticians, to be honest, they, I mean, challenge this concept. And they say that the I square it just gives you an idea how much the percentage of the ob observed effects compared to the real effect world. I'm not going to go to the depth of this technical issue. How we are presenting the result or reporting the meta-analysis. We have got what we call it the forest plot. And in the forest, pl forest plot, I will just go and come back into this slide. We will have uh, the first thing is the line of no effect. We know that the line of the no effect, where there is no effect of the intervention, and it will be the central line. Either it lies on the point zero or point one. Zero and one, depending on the, the estimate of the effect size, whether we are using hazard ratio, odds ratio, or relative risk, or we are using a difference called the mean difference or standardized mean of difference. Clearly, if there is no difference in the ratio, should be one because the denominator would be equal to the denominator. And if it is a difference like the mean difference or standardized mean of difference, if it is the, uh, the uh, intervention is equal effect, so the result will be zero. And that's why we can see here, this line of no effect lies on one. What is the outcome we are measuring? It is the hazard ratio. So if it is a ratio, it will be at one. And if it is a difference will be at zero, as we can see here, probably the difference here, which is the standardized or weighed, uh, weighed mean difference. And this is at zero. Back again. The effect size is either a ratio or a difference. We have mentioned already that effect size either in boxes or circles. And the, I mean, the size of the box or the circle of each study will be proportionate to the, usually the number of participants or the relative weight of this study to the whole uh, meta-analysis. We can see here, say for example, this is study 24%, and this is the circle, and the circle means that this is the mean of the outcome, and this is the mean of the outcome, 19%, 25%, and when you total them, it will be the 100%. And these will be the confidence, 95 confidence intervals, and as we know, if it didn't cross the line of no effect, whether it is one or zero, then it would be significant. And the significance would be either in favor of the treatment if it is on this side or in favor of placebo if it is on this side. And this diamond is the bold analysis with the peak of the diamond is the mean and the edges of the diamond is the confidence interval or 95 confidence interval, as we can see here very clearly. Uh, obviously, the confidence interval, as we all know that it corresponds to the study precision, and the, the higher precision, 
the higher the number of participants and the less confidence intervals, the, the small number of participants, the small, the small precision uh, and the uh, less number of participants. And we can see this is very clearly, you can see here 2000 and the confidence interval is uh, small, 8000, the confidence interval is even smaller. If we look into this one, you can see how much is it and the number of participants just only 10, which is very, very odd. This is the number of participants here where it is around 22 and it constitutes 67% of the weight of the meta-analysis. Uh, we said about the heterogeneity, which is the I square, which is 49%. Obviously, this is not a substantial uh, heterogeneity here. And most of them, they have got the same or the similar effect. And we will come to what we call it fixed effect or random effects model. What is the difference between both? Because you need to know it very clearly. I mean, fixed effect model is rare one, although it has been used very frequently in the systematic review and the meta-analysis. When we are using the fixed effect model, this means that we are using it for a similar population, similar participants, similar intervention, usually similar outcome. And you can see something like this, it will be a fixed effect. There is not much heterogeneity. But if the heterogeneity is high, then we are looking at the random effects model, which will be the more appropriate. Why we are just using these two different terms? Because simply using the inappropriate uh, statistics for the different type of meta-analysis will come up with the wrong result, and you need to challenge it. Like what? We'll share see you now in a minute. So the random effect model is used when we aim to generalize the outcome, and when we use studies with different population, it takes into account the heterogeneity and the difference between studies. The fixed model, this is the same population, same protocol, and the results applies only to this specific type of population. And if we look at this, the multiple population heterogeneity generalized the, the results, you will use the random effect model, but you, will, you can't use the fixed effect model. And you can see here, if we are talking about the kidney outcome with the SGLT2 inhibitor, this is nearly all these programs nearly have got the same type of population, diabetic with minimal proteinuria, and the renal outcome was nearly the same. Why, what are the importance of having, I mean, two different types of models and what are the implication? Obviously the effect size is wrong if you use the inappropriate type of model and the p-value will be inaccurate with the fixed effect model. The p-value will be usually very significant and the precision will be very high uh, because the type of population nearly the same and the confidence in the interval will be is too narrow. We will look into this, uh, I mean, example and we can see how they have just handled this example. Uh, the authors said that we included all of uh, available randomized control trial. So first of all, this is the PICO format. So what are the type of patients or participants? Normotensive diabetic kidney disease. What are the IC, which is the intervention, and what are the comparator? Uh, it is the placebo, the comparator, or any other antihypertensive. And the other one, I can't see the, uh, to be honest, the, it will be the RAS inhibition. What are the outcome? It is the glomerular change in the glomerular filtration rate. Very simple, very straightforward question. They would like to assess the RAS inhibition in patients with normal intensive diabetic kidney disease uh, versus those who are on placebo or uh, other antihypertensive medication or agents. Uh, and then they didn't mention uh, the differences between the reviewers when they are using the, the uh, search literature will be resolved by consultation with the third reviewer, but they didn't mention the CABA score or the level of agreement. Well, uh, two authors independently, they have authorized this. So the methodology of the systematic review is very clear and they have searched the midline in base Cochrane. They didn't mention anything about the unpublished uh, trial. They haven't had any language restriction. Then have we can, sometimes you can just put, I mean, the systematic review and the meta-analysis to see 
whether they have included all the studies of this particular topic or not. We have got two types of plots, one called the funnel plot and the other one called the bubble plot. What is the funnel plot? In the funnel plot, you can pick up if there is any publication bias. How is the publication bias? Usually, if it is, I mean, you have got uh, equally distributed uh, ratio, then you will, you will have this funnel when you put or plot the standard the error of the mean against the outcome, which is the odds ratio. Clearly, the odds ratio here, you are putting it in the logarithmic numbers, 0, 1, 1, uh, not 0 0.1, and then 1, and then 10, in tens. And the standard error of the mean, you are ascending to 0, 0.5, 1, 1.5, to get this outcome. What will be, you will find the number of studies here nearly equal to the number of the studies here if it is equally distributed with the, I mean, uh, the, uh, with these studies. But if there is any publication bias, you will find the, you can say this, some of these studies will disappear. And if you found that the, uh, the funnel plot has got this asymmetry, then you will, be, you will say that definitely there is some sort of publication bias and there are some studies have not been published here. And I need to look into it, why it has not been published to just address it before you can publish your systematic review or meta-analysis. And then you have got what we call it the bubble plot or the meta-regression. When you have got many or multiple outcomes from the meta from the meta analysis, and you would like to see, and you found or you picked up some heterogeneity in the results, then you would like to know what is the cause of this heterogeneity. Say, for example, this uh, intervention works better for the proteinuric patients rather than the non-proteinuric. So you do what we call it meta regression and the R square when you just plot the log odds ratio of the outcome against this particular type and you adjust exactly like the linear regression. You adjust for the other, other confounders. And you can see at the end whether the R square is high and can explain this heterogeneity or not. And you can come up with the sub-analysis uh, sub or subgroup analysis to say that, okay, probably this intervention of the SGLT2 inhibitor works better for the proteinuric versus the non-proteinuric patients with diabetic kidney disease. This is our examples where we can see very clearly how the pool, the analysis, very significant at 0.6, the hazard ratio, clearly the intervention of the, uh, hospital, so of the SGLT2 for the hospitalization for heart failure, uh, obviously versus placebo is great with the, and they reduce the risk by around 34%, sorry, 32%, because it is 0.68. And the I square is zero, uh, very, very homogeneous, uh, non -heterogene no heterogeneity here, and the fixed effect model can be applied very easily. And this is the same hospitalization for heart failure by uh, having a different outcome, or the participant here is different from the participant in the other one here for all heart failure. And then we have got subgroup analysis, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And then you can see the different outcome. If you have got atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, still it is significant, but the uh, re reduction, risk reduction is around 30%. But if you uh, have got this uh, without the atherosclerotic heart disease, the risk reduction is 37% uh, compared to the placebo. This one is, uh, to be honest, I don't know. The, I mean, it is, looks to me as hetero, I mean, I square is zero. And as I'm saying that there are some people, they say that the I square could be challenged. But anyway, they have used the fixed effect model and they are claiming that this is all uh, non-heterogeneous studies. Uh, obviously some of them, they are crossing the uh, line of no effect and in, uh, statistically non-significant, as you can see, but the pooled and, and the pooled analysis is non-significant as well because it crosses the uh, no effect line. Uh, there are many other uh, standards of, I mean, looking into the, uh, the quality of the studies other than the Jadad and other than the Cochrane. We have got something called the CASP and the CASP have got assessment tool for the systematic review, for the meta-analysis, 
for the randomized control trial, and you put the checklist for each one, and you can come up with a conclusion to say the quality was high, or and put it on the grid or put it on the diagram that I mentioned. Uh, obviously, I can't leave without just mentioning that when we just did uh, this uh, book about the role of randomized control trial in uh, clinical nephrology, me, uh, obviously, Professor Anahas was the leader, and myself and uh, Dr. Al-Kawaja, we have put our own uh, assessment tool for the randomized control trial quality, and we have put this uh, checklist, and we said that we have put some weight for each one of them, whether the randomization procedure is well described in the uh, study or not, whether it is double blinded or single blind, if it is double blinded, it will take a score of two. If it is single blinded or not blinded at all or not mentioned, it takes minus two. Uh, we look into also the number needed to treat. If it is less than 100, this means that it's a high quality study and it will benefit because of the results will benefit a lot of people. Uh, can the findings be generalized or not? And also if the analysis of the statistics of the study was the intention to treat, or uh, per protocol treatment, completely different. And the dropout rate, if it is more than 25%, this means that I can't rely that much because the attrition bias will be very high. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohsen, for this very instructive uh, presentation. It is really inspiring and uh, explains a lot of, uh, of the uh, dark points in our understanding of the statistics that we read. Uh, you are actually passing to our uh, young colleagues the important uh, message that not all what is printed and published becomes, uh, becomes a fact. Because you ask a student about something, he mentions jargon, you tell him this jargon is jargon, and he says, Maktouba ya basha. Tab mahay maktouba di, yani, yani mahay maktouba, ila azik tib yiktu. El mohem me eno, this critical mind, that when you read something, if you know how to do this analysis, fine, you can do it. But if you don't know how to do this analysis, just take it with caution. Because uh, at one point, somebody is going to challenge this information, and maktouba ya basha doesn't really mean uh, it, it is a fact. Uh, what you mentioned eventually leads to a guideline. And uh, as I uh, mentioned when you, before you started, um, are we all happy with the guidelines today? Or are there drawbacks to uh, the guideline developed through this uh, whole path that you mentioned? Because as you mentioned, there are exclusion and inclusion criteria. And uh, your patient doesn't necessarily be one of those eligible for the clinical trials uh, that, uh, on which the, the, the data were based. And so eventually, if you apply the guideline without really trying to place your patient into the trial uh, population, then you may be going uh, the wrong way. Uh, and that's why every guideline published anywhere in the world would put a disclaimer that it, this is not a law, this is not the rule, this is a guideline. And guideline means that it guides you uh, about uh, information related to a treatment or a diagnostic technique or whatever, if your patient can fit within the study population. And that we tend to neglect. So individualization of treatment, I think, is still very important. And the guidelines are not rules. They are only guidelines. Uh, would you like to add something to this or challenge this or whatever? I entirely agree with what you've mentioned. The guidelines, they are guidelines. And when we are applying the guidelines, I have to apply what is particularly of interest to my patient. And uh, that's why maybe the importance of this talk is just to see whether this, my patient, is one of those patients who can be part of the trials or part of these guidelines or cannot be. So I'm sure that it is not something that I mean, uh, I need to take it uh, as a ground and without just looking into what's going on. I need to have the, see, the scene behind that. And at the end of the day, it is guideline rather than something uh, solid. And I need to just, I mean, apply it perfectly as it is being mentioned. Very good. This leads us to the second step of our doubts about 
the universal application of guidelines. Uh, when I see if my patients can fit into the study population or not, uh, I'll put him or exclude him on the basis of what I see or what I know about my patient. But when you go into the depth of pharmacogenetics, for instance, maybe my patient would fit into the study population, but has a pharmacogenetic variance uh, and will handle the drug that you are talking about in a different way than that others who are superficially similar to my patient. But in fact, there is a deep and important pharmacogenetic factor that may ELT2 inhibitors, for instance, uh, in a way is a bit different in my patients who looks very much like the study population. So with, even within, within the conformity with the study population, there are dark points that we don't see in our patients with the presence tools of classifying the patient. And that's why we have got nowadays what we call it, or it is evolving, the precision medicine. Yes, when sir. in the precision medicine, you need to apply not only the guidelines and the randomized control trial and the evidence, you have got other factors contributing and playing uh, yes. behind the scene, including the environment, including the genetic backup, uh, sorry, or the makeup of the of these patients. Perfect. So I wanted to drag you into this point that we are now moving into individualization rather than the generalization right. of guidelines. <laughs> 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 That's why I'm saying that it is evolving nowadays, the precision medicine. Yes, yes sir. <laughs> <laughs> excuse Thank me, you, excuse you. me. Thanks, please, yes. Excuse me, uh, Professor Rashad, Professor Mahsam, does this mean that we are back again to the opinions in medicine? Not at all. No, <laughs> we, the guidelines have already formulated uh, a very strong base for what is useful and what is not useful. But now we, be, we want to be more precise about uh, the applicability of a guideline to a particular patient. We need to know more of the variables mm -hmm. that can modify the outcome of a guideline when applied to Mr. Muhammad Abdul Samir in particular. Right, Mohsen? Yes, and this is what I'm saying, yes. that there is a field yeah. called the precision medicine now is evolving, yeah. taking into account the genetics uh, of this uh, patient uh, or the pharmacogenetics and the environment rule of this particular patient, and it will be individualized. And you have got, at the same time, the evidence base that you have got from the guideline. You are not uh, just leaving the guidelines. You will take them, yeah. because this is the gold standard so far that we have got in our hands. Yeah. The other areas are still evolving. Yes. And mind you that we don't have guidelines for 90% of diseases that we see, right? Guidelines are available for no more than 10% of the diseases that we see. So you are left in the dark with yes. the majority of the patients without that's guidelines. That's true. That's true. And that's why you, can, you come up, say, for example, when we have been doing the guidelines for the SGLT2 inhibitor, uh, I have been asked myself to look into the ro their role in the uh, kidney transplantation. And I've looked into the literature and I've included in my slides only one meta-analysis, which is, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, it's a rubbish meta-analysis. Meta the participants were 20 and 10, so the power is not there. Uh, uh, there is no evidence at all, you can say. And I said that clearly, we don't have any evidence. And the recommendation for the renal association came to say that at the end, and they agreed about our opinion that there is no evidence so far to support the use of the SGLT2 inhibitor in the population of the kidney transplant until we have got more evidence to support that. Uh, uh, Professor Are Rashad, uh, Professor Faisal Shaheen want, Professor Faisal Shaheen wants to comment and ask Please, questions. Professor Faisal. Zaka Faisal, Ahlul yeah. Sahel, now we're back. Ahlul Sahel, virtually, Ahlul Sahel. Thank you very much. Uh, Mohsin, great talk. There is no doubt. I think we learned a lot today, as usual. You are uh, very eminent since uh, we know you a long time back. And uh, this uh, topic is, is a difficult topic because I think each patient, we have to tell whatever he is going to wear uh, according to, again, the background, the, the clinical, and uh, what you think also as a physician. And also you have to go with the guideline as well in order not to bias, not everyone uh, treat as he want, but he have to have 
reference for what he's going to implement for the patient. So it's still, uh, I know as uh, Prof. Uh, Rashad, he said that not everything we have guideline for it, but still we guideline can help us to, to give uh, or manage our patient. Uh, and uh, I know that probably someone will not agree about what I said, but this is my own feeling, which is not accepted in, in medicine. Thank you. Can I have a comment? Sure. Okay, thank you. I entirely agree with what you said. It's just only the thing is, we have got the confines or the limitations that we are moving within. I mean, if, they, if we don't have the guidelines, we will be floating everywhere, but yes. probably the guidelines will make some sort of limitation uh, among us to what we are choosing. If we don't have the guidelines, it is this, I mean, lecture or it is this talk to, to I mean, uh, to, to for all ourselves to learn how we can drag the best available evidence if we don't have the guideline. Thank you. And again, one important, if you allow me, Mr. Chairman, that uh, we have to, to think about the influence of the pharmaceutical company also by using some drug uh, and, and changing the mind of the physician, which probably some of those are not uh, dependent about a very good study, but still they have a good influence in, in the mind of the physician. Uh, you don't mention that, Mohsin, isn't it? Or I... I... Yes, uh, among us, the ethical uh, part of the quality of the studies. Obviously, yeah. the, I mean, this is the disclosure and the conflict of interest, but it should be already, I mean, discussed by the ethical committee. But it would be great at the end of the day to mention clearly that if you have got, say, for example, any conflict of interest to write down in the paper or you have got any funding from this company or that company, so I will be aware what's going on. Hey, Dr. Ahmed Al, I will have a انت ميوتد يا دكتور احمد يو هاف تو طيب شكرا جزيلا وانا ما كنتش ميوتد مش من عندي انا ان ميوتد اوكي فيرست اوف اول اي وود لايك تو ثانك يو فيري ماتش دكتور محسن فور ذس هوت توبيك اند اوف كورس اور بروفيسور رشاد فور هيز اليجنت كومنتس اولسو دكتور ياسر فور فور ذس هايلي اكتيف سي ام اي we all uh, learn from it. Uh, I have uh, a question, uh, it came to my mind that how we, uh, uh, as we have the top expertise now in, in nephrology, uh, and uh, I need to know personally even uh, how to, how can we uh, balance between the, uh, uh, the meta-analysis review, uh, systematic reviews, uh, guidelines, and also uh, a new uh, issue that we are facing every day is the hospital policies. So uh, every now and then, we need to update our hospital policy regarding one topic. For example, contrast and nephropathy. Is it really you need to do one, two, three, four, five, six, or uh, we can change or we can increase uh, regarding electrolyte disturbance, what you should do? Uh, sometimes the hospital policy is limited to the uh, certain guidelines and they need to be updated every now and then. But also I can see that it will guide the, uh, the flow of the management of the patients within the hospital. So one hospital, uh, you can find uh, most of the management by the resident is following the hospital policy, because if he breaks the policy, he will be somehow, uh, it will be against the hospital policy with certain uh, action from the uh, admin service. So I need to know uh, from, from your great experience, how we can uh, manipulate if we have a patient is not uh, really uh, within the scope of the guidelines. And also uh, we have this uh, hospital policy uh, in front of us. How, ca how can we manipulate uh, such a patient in the uh, uh, new uh, evolutionary uh, hospital and the healthcare uh, environment? Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Uh, obviously, I, I mean, before I can start on this thing, no guideline, without systematic review, uh, without meta-analysis, and no meta-analysis without systematic review. The question would be very difficult. When you don't have the material, or when you don't have the, it's a rare disease, and you don't have the, uh, the material to just get a, a well-designed systematic review and the meta-analysis. 
At this point, the hospital policy should be within the available evidence outside, obviously, the, I mean, the uh, systematic review or meta-analysis. And we need to follow what's been in the hospital policy. I mean, this is the rule, in my opinion, this is the rule of the organizations in each country. Say, for example, the renal association in, in the UK, they set up their own guidelines. And when they are setting up their own guidelines, they look into the international guidelines, what suits the UK in particular, what does, I mean, disputes with our uh, patient population, uh, healthy economics in terms of whether we have got this available or not available. And then we come up with our own guidelines to suit our patient population. And I believe that, and still we have got our hospital guidelines, which should be in uh, essence, consistent with the national guidelines. So this, I believe the role of the associations and the, uh, and the health authorities to say, for example, uh, establish the guidelines universally for the, I mean, for the uh, country, and then the different hospitals will just establish the guidelines derived uh, from these uh, national guidelines, what suits the local environment. If there is no systematic review and no uh, meta-analysis, then it will be expert opinion uh, based on the available uh, evidence the hospital will do, and I will just have to stick to what's uh, available. To be honest, this is my uh, personal opinion. I'm not sure whether Prof. Rashad would like to... Well, I, I was uh, involved in uh, two or three of the Kedigo uh, guidelines, and um, uh, we, we had a very hot discussion at the beginning of how compelling would be the guideline statements to the world, to India, to Zimbabwe, and to the United uh, Kingdom. Uh, and we agreed that uh, we have to express every item in the guideline by a letter and a number. The letter ABC is the quality of evidence, and that is science. All what Mohsen has mentioned has to end up with a, a, a letter. Level A is a very high scientific thing based on meta-analysis and blah, blah, and B is uh, less and not specific the same population and so on, uh, and C and D. That is uh, academic science with evidence and you can't change it. In India, like in the United States, like in Egypt. But then you put a number. Number is the recommendation, whether to implement this guideline as your first choice or second choice or third choice, depending on local factors, including costs, including comorbidities in a community, including environmental factors and so on. So a level A uh, evidence, can be A1 in America, but A3 in Egypt, because we can't afford it, for example. And I think this is the area where a hospital policy can work through. The hospital policy has no right to change the level of evidence. They can't repeat all Mohsen uh, mentioned, uh, but they can say that in our hospital, we are a district hospital, our patients are too poor, our budget is too limited. We also have parasitic diseases here, which can modify the response to cyclosporin and so on. So eventually the hospital can, can degrade the level uh, of uh, evidence on the, on, on, uh, on the level of recommendation rather than value, the real scientific value of something. But eventually it needs a very um, understanding board in the hospital to be aware of the facts by A, B, and C and aware of the reasons why you are going to degrade it or upgrade it. Uh, and explain this to the doctors that we are going to put this A as A3 because blah, blah, blah. Uh, then uh, once it's agreed upon by an illuminated conscious uh, readers in the hospital board, then it has to be followed because you can't have a heterogeneous uh, treatment in a particular hospital. You have to do what the hospital board says. If you have an objection, then go to the hospital board, tell them I want to change the level of recommendation because uh, but uh, I think both the guideline is correct and right and needed, and the hospital policy is also correct and right and needed. Thank you very much, Professor Rashad and uh, Professor Mas, for this uh, elegant discussion. Thank you. Any more this, uh, questions or remarks or comments uh, to Mas? Uh, uh, yes, Professor Rashad, Professor Rashad Dr. Baha wants to comment. Yes, please. Uh, I want to ask the question. Oh, I think, uh, I think you. it's Bazaid. 
Yes, yes. Thank you, CSR. Thank you, Professor Barsoum and the company, Professor Mohsen. Well, I have a comment and question, please. Uh, first of all, comment about the guidelines. Not all the guidelines dependent upon uh, the systemic review or meta-analysis. For example, we have the key deco guidelines on high blood pressure. They mainly depend on the sprint trial. And there's a good, a large bias in the trial because they depend on the automated, unattended, automated office blood pressure. And they built on the guidelines on the method of measurement of blood pressure, which is not applicable in most of the hypertension clinics or even most of the world. So the guidelines here put us in a big trouble. We have to apply the guidelines or at least follow the guidelines, but the methods of measurement or methods of application of the guidelines doesn't, doesn't uh, apply in my country or my clinic. So there's a lot of dilemma about the guidelines and how they depend on the, the clinical trial. And again, for example, in the heart failure trial, for example, we have uh, interest was RD, Secamitrial versus 10, give an indication of 1B, depends on one clinical trial, one randomized clinical trial. And the commentator said that we we'll not have to repeat the trial or do meta analysis. We believe in the trial because a large number of patients were included and they give a class 1B indication for heart failure with half ref or half pef. So the guidelines doesn't depend only on the uh, meta analysis. If there's a meta analysis, that'd be nice. But if there is no meta analysis, they depend on the randomized, large randomized clinical trial, and they put it. And there is a lot of bias in here because sometimes who did the clinical trial? The guidelines. And this is a big bias that we see in a sprint. This is a comment and a question for Professor Kusi. Uh, you put a meta analysis for SGL2 and kidney. Uh, when you revise the data in the different clinical trials in the SGL2, you find the different population. Patient, for example, in the empiric study, all of them were established cardiovascular disease. When you go to the canvas or the declared to me, only 40% of them had established cardiovascular disease. Uh, again, in credence, patient with credence has proteinuria, more than 300 up to 5 grams proteinuria. In the impaired and the declared or the empiric, there is no proteinuria in this patient. So how you can put all of them together and you see the meta-analysis, all the patients, oh, yes, we know this diabetic. We know this have a good benefit. We know this. But only put meta-analysis, different patient population, with different inclusion criteria, and you find a good significant result. How do you can answer this question? Thank you. Shall I answer? Shall yes, please. Sure. OK, thank you. So first of all, as regards that there is no, uh, I mean, there are some guidelines without meta-analysis. It's simply because there is no high quality meta-analysis no high quality randomized controlled trial, or it is only a very limited number, it is one, and you can't do meta-analysis from only a single trial. So this is the reason why these guidelines have been developed, uh, because there were no high quality type of uh, studies to include, or the quality of the meta-analysis will not be that great to drag from them a good quality evidence base or guidelines. As regards the, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitor, it is a huge issue because we are mixing up many outcomes, we have got probably four or five outcomes, whether we are talking about the, I mean, proteinuria uh, improvement or not, we are talking about the cardiovascular death or not, renal death or not, or we are talking about uh, the uh, all cause mortality or not. For each of these outcomes, there is a different type of parameters that we are using. So the proteinuria that you are talking about we have got not only the credence, we have got the credence and we have got the CKD and BD, uh, sorry, we have got the uh, DABA CKD. Both of them, they have got proteinuria. And both of them, they have got good evidence that the proteinuria improved with the use of the SGLT2 inhibitor, whether it is the canagliflozin or the dabagliflozin. So it depends on the outcome that you are talking about. All cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality. Then I will talk about what are the participants that you are and I have shown one of the slides. Say, for example, the hospitalization for heart failure, when the patient has got, say, for example, background of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the risk reduction is around 37%. But if they don't have a background of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the risk reduction of hospitalization for heart failure patients is reduced to around 32%. Still works better, uh, good, but it is not as good as if you have got 
atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So, and this is the rule of the meta-analysis to analyze each outcome for this particular participant. Did I answer the question or still unclear? Uh, Rawa. Please unmute. No, he has unmuted. Please, one, one second, please. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, ياسر في الكنترول روم اصله هو بني عنا كل حاجه اه ومنع عني انا والله في البدايه برضه عمال اتكلم واقول له بس هي هاسته الصراحه لان لو سبناها كده نوت اني ديفرنت هتبقى في بايس كتير وتبقى نادر اندومايز مش هينفع فاهم؟ اي جات ذا ايديا ثانك يو سو ماتش بروفيسور ثانك يو ثانك يو ثانك يو اذر كويشنز تو دكتور مارتن اي هاف ا كويشن بروفيسور رشاد بليز يس بليز جو اهيد دكتور محسن اوكي ما هو انا انا ياسر عبد الحميد اه هو انت ياسر اوكي اه شال اي ميوت يو سو مان ميوتد مي ها ديد وي ثانك يو ديد وي جيم ماتش بروفيسور محسن فروم يوزنج ذا كونفدنس انترفل ان انتربريتيشن اوف ذا ستاديز ادينج مور تو ذا باور اوف ميتا اناليسيز اند سيستماتيك ريفيو Did it make a big, dif a big difference in using this statistical uh, method? To be honest, I mean, this is too technical and I don't like to complicate the issue. But I mean, the basic yeah. rule is the high precision, the narrow confidence interval, the very high participant uh, rate. So you can see that from the studies with the high population, high number of population, the, uh, and the, uh, the confidence interval will be very narrow and the precision will very be narrow. very high hmm. okay it's clear very very smart and answer and very clear answer thank you yeah and you can see on the uh, on the uh, uh, the plot you can see in the funnel plot that most of the smallest studies with the high uh, with the low precision at the bottom of the uh, of the pyramid or the funnel and the high precision one which comes to near to the true effect size at, at the top of the uh, funnel or the pyramid with a very high number of participants and narrow uh, confidence interval. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Ahmed, I'd like to tell you, yes. Okay. Okay. But the dolo sot, the dolo microphone. Unmute him, man. Okay. Please, Professor Ahmed, do you want to comment again? Yes. Uh, I have uh, only one, one question, and the answer, uh, I think, will be directed to uh, our, uh, our uh, fresh uh, residents and uh, nephrology fellows. Uh, that uh, it came to my mind that why I, now uh, I need to read any study? Why not I go directly to collect all the guidelines in uh, two hours and put it printed and put it in front of me on the desk and memorize all of them? and uh, go ahead to implement this on my clinic uh, or during my round with my uh, supervisor. Uh, what, what will we drive me to, to read all this sophisticated meta-analysis uh, research and, uh, and I go on the classic way to start from the, uh, uh, from the basic studies and uh, to go deep, especially if I'm not uh, involved in uh, active research. Because I know when we do master degree or uh, PhD or uh, even uh, research for uh, any kind, uh, official kind that uh, direct us to do it instead of the uh, special interest, uh, we can do it. But if, if just a clinical fellow and he want to, to do a clinical work, what will drive him to read the research in, uh, uh, and not only guidelines? And thank you very much. Very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, clearly, Professor Rashad has answered this question in, in, a, in a way when he said that 90% of our diseases, we don't have guidelines. Now, if we don't have a guideline for 90%, nine out of 10 diseases, we don't have guidelines, how he is going to use the best available evidence without knowing how he can read these papers? I believe. So he should yeah. have the basics of how he can, I mean, get the uh, the evidence base from the published literature 
he can differentiate and discriminate between what is good to, I mean, uh, to apply and what is, I mean, not fake or fabricated or whatever it would be, you are a lot of bias in the, uh, in the paper, he will be able to do that to the point that now in the Cochrane Library, we have got, say, for example, 50 speciality, and we have got many uh, systematic review, and you can update this systematic review yourself by just coming and adding your input in this systematic review. So, I mean, those junior, they can participate in the research by updating the systematic review, because don't forget that the evidence is evolving every day. And what has been written for a systematic review and the citation number 10 years ago, clearly different from what we have got now. Every year we have got more uh, evidence uh, generating and he needs to add to this or contribute. So if he's unable to contribute, at least he will be able for himself to help himself to decide what is the appropriate treatment for a particular patient. I may add that uh, one of the disadvantages of guidelines is what you say, Ahmed, that they are so overwhelming that but many doctors stop thinking. They just take the text as it is and implement it and they are safe, safe legally and safe professionally and safe everything uh, by just applying the guideline. Uh, doctors used to think more before the guidelines were available. Uh, but uh, I think we should not encourage people to, uh, to just get lazy and only read what other people have made for them. They still have to think they have, still have to for an outcome of treatment or diagnosis on the basis of guideline or the particular patient and try to think around this. If they don't improve, then what is the point? They're not improving or the test does not apply very much and so on. So we shouldn't, we shouldn't encourage them to be overwhelmed uh, so much that their brains become um, lazy, if you wish. And I must remind you that every guideline would, would write, uh, by the end of every chapter, a list of research questions. Uh, so that at least can be taken in consideration and stimulate them to do some more work to complete the information about the guideline. So guideline is, is great, it's very useful, uh, but we should all be aware as senior uh, nephrologists we should be aware of the possible side effects of using guidelines all the way uh, by our younger colleagues. Agreed, Mohsen? Yeah, uh, I, 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 I mean, I don't think that I need to add anything. Okay, thank you. I can't I add the, anything. The, the message is now <laughs> clear. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. <laughs> then I return the- No more, microphone. no more, sir, and no more questions. No more questions. So uh, it's uh, Yasser that uh, has to conclude. Thank you, Yasser, for inviting me and for giving me this wonderful opportunity uh, of uh, learning from Mohsen, uh, as I mentioned earlier on. Fadal Yasser. Shukran, Mohsen. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Uh, I'm a uh, Thank you, Professor Rashad, for being with us in this. He is a heavy scientific, scientific night explanation, explaining all of these informations to us and illustrating many and many points. Uh, thank you, Professor Mohsen, for this highly elegant uh, talk uh, that I felt really we need to revise it and repeat it at ease many, many and more times to uh, understand how systematic reviews and meta-analysis uh, can we go with. Uh, thank you for this uh, heavy night and I hope to repeat uh, this night many and many times with how to understand research and uh, to go with uh, this to understand and easy apply research and uh, evidence-based stats. Uh, excuse me to conclude uh, this session and uh, we have uh, no more sessions this month as we have our major scientific activity is NT uh, 14th Congress which will be from 15th to 19th February this month. And we hope to meet you all physically during the activities of the conference. And we will resume, inshallah, back our activities in the start of March. And we will announce about our schedule uh, early before uh, this month. Thank you again, Professor Rashad. And we are Thank proud you. to have you uh, with us today. Thank you, Professor Mohsen, for your I'm highly, you. highly 
elegant, highly illustrated, a simple uh, talk. And excuse me to conclude. Thank you. 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 Thank you.